Hello, my name is Tara Furnall. This is a brief virtual presentation of the workshop Improving Client Care and Professional Communications I gave at the recent Rapal conference. In professional services, whether legal, building, finance, design, or any other you care to name, integrating industry knowledge with attentive client care and communication sees grateful clients through the difficult situations they have consulted with you on. The most defining feature is, of course, getting the job done ideally to time scale and within costs. In communication, however, problem resolution across industries uses language to frame clients' interests in relation to pertinent features and situational context, in particular, assessing risk and evaluating potential courses of action. And a successful conclusion is highly dependent on the relationship established between professional and client during initial and ongoing dialogue. This brief presentation distills findings from a comparative linguistic analysis of solicitors' written communication and recommends structures and language features that contribute to improving client care while protecting both parties' interests. In highly competitive economies, where there is significant blending between professional, vocational, and academic formation in any specialization, Quality preparation for any career ensures prompt problem identification and resolution in liaison with the client. First, let's consider communication features of poor client care. These can include an inexplicit sense of rudeness, uncertainty, lack of clarity regarding agency action and risk, and ineffective inter-party communication. Before looking at detailed findings and recommendations, We'll quickly review the generic frameworks currently available. Functional adult qualification frameworks in communication direct us to broad features of complexity, clarity, adaptation to context, and moving discussions forward. These here are speaking and listening frameworks. They also focus on concise, logical presentation and structure, and clear meaning. These are the writing frameworks. It can be challenging to establish exactly what to cover and how. Future developments in the field in the UK are looking at the concept of authorship and communicating, ownership of text produced for a given audience, and responsibility for their effective impact. It is commonplace to find a base format or model to work around. The skill lies in expressing the detail of attention to your business's and clients' context. Accessing literature ties into reading fiction. However, in a broader sense, it is identification and interaction, cognitively and emotionally, with complex social interactions and experiences that otherwise might be outside the reader's personal experience. This extends a person's range of appropriate responses to situations extending the capacity to put yourself in another's shoes and working out what is going on and what you might do. This small group activity considers which groups of client care you particularly focus on developing and how you go about this. You're welcome to pause the presentation momentarily if you would like thinking time, which helps with engagement, understanding and attention. It also helps to lay the groundwork for scaffolding in the features we will be covering. To give a little background to the study before we examine the findings, case studies of legal communications, poor versus exemplar, demonstrated an overlap between professional competence and linguistic performance. It is hard to think of a profession more likely to ensure its own interests are protected in communication than one with a legal 500 firm, which confirms that the communication formats are likely to be rigorous for both parties. A combined systemic functional linguistic analysis and discourse analysis was conducted as it provides a detailed and thorough method of interrogating the relationship between choices in the forms and structures of language, meaning making, and social functions through concepts of context of situation or register and context of culture or genre. This overlap between choices in forms, meaning, and social relationships are pivotal. We will look at genre first. This broadly considers overall structural features. Letters are generally recognised as comprising greeting, introduction, body of content, concluding points, and sign-off. 
We looked at this in the workshop, considering how the stages could be categorized and how stage-appropriate client care might be incorporated. It may be worth pausing the presentation temporarily to think about this in your own context. So, you see derived what can be described as seven social stages to a client communication. At each stage, attention which interacts with, responds to, and in many ways preempts the client, actively forming and developing the client relationship and service provision. We'll look at detailed features that might exist in each of these stages in a moment. Summarily, after greeting the client, there is a succinct reminder of the matter at hand before a form of positive response is expressed and relevant associated input given. These first three stages firmly and courteously establish a familiar state of play with the client. Then, during stages four and five, additional considerations to date are incorporated, which are likely to be the new ground, and as such, client concerns and questions are predicted and responded to. The client is not left hanging or wondering about querying. Closing routines incorporate progressing future actions and leave-taking establishes further contact on the matter. Stages four and five may be cycled through a number of times in an extended communication. Each stage of these attentions are directly connected to progressing the matter at hand while consolidating the relationship. Please do not overlook that these are derived from legal negotiations. Misrepresentation or significant omission are not available allowances. It is worth analysing this structure for how it contributes to reducing stress levels for clients and how this can contribute to the client care that you offer. Below you'll see parts of a letter. Consider pausing for a moment, ordering the letter and identifying the client care attributes. And here is the letter in full. If you'd like to pause and analyse it, you'll note its clear structure and attention to client care at each stage. It is polite, clear and direct, also in terms of agency, action and risk. We'll now move on to other features this letter exemplifies. As well as overall structure and stages, there are particular language features which contribute to attentive, quality client care. These will be available in more detail and resources to be published shortly. At a glance, there are aspects of how matters are represented in terms of who is doing what and how that is relevant. The exemplar solicitor represented a world in which the client and solicitor had significant agency. The poor example, on the other hand, gave dominant agency to the rest of the world, with the solicitor having marginally less and the client very little. Clients tend to pay high charges to establish what they're able to do about their affairs. It makes sense to maintain focus on agency and problem resolution. Modes of interaction showed significant differences between the poor legal service and the exemplar. The exemplar operated in terms of offers, the poor example didn't. There are sophisticated ways of negotiating effective interactions, which we unfortunately don't have time to explore in full here. However, an example might be, rather than stating that certain documentation or information needs to be submitted, to offer help to the client to ensure it is returned by the required date. How commands and questions are moderated with language significantly affects the relationship established. Another feature was operating in terms of acceptance, acknowledgement, answer and supply, rather than contradiction and refusal. Where a positive response is problematic, it is often possible to rework the conceptualization and find another way to express something so you can turn it into a positive offer. This may be stating the case a little more clearly around a sticking point or opening another field of options, including passing the matter on to another party. Managing formality versus informality had a number of interesting findings. The poor example mixed excessive formality, particularly with greeting and leave taking and colourful literary language that was at times derogatory, such as refusing telephone contact because of the diary being peppered with appointments. 
It would generally be advisable to avoid colourful, literary, familiar or excessively formal language in professional communications. The exemplar, on the other hand, varied greeting and leave-taking and included formulaic polite terms of interaction which contributed to reducing social distance and establishing accessibility, such as please feel free, while the body of the communication was direct and formal. Pronoun and possessive usage also showed differences around who was represented and how. The poor example mixed references frequently refer to the client as an addendum to sentences rather than directly, and used my to refer territorially to a wide range of items, largely unnecessarily. The mixed use of we included reference to the client and solicitor jointly, which can confuse a client in respect of who is doing what exactly. The exemplar, on the other hand, delimited carefully where we only refer to his firm, for example, and your, the matter. Modality in language use has many roles, including representing the future, will, may, negotiating politely into personal grammatical metaphor, would you, communicating likelihood, could, and desirability, must, and therefore risk and open and closed stance personas, which broadly refers to the degree of commitment to what is said. We do not have time to look in full at all of these, however I have selected two. Firstly, communicating likelihood. These two extracts contrast clear, high commitment input, will, are able, will, with seesaw and confusion, where a strong expect sits next to a weak may. Confusingly colourful language is also present, where curing a problem suggests an issue with a resolution, but the topic is introduced by saying not to raise it. In communicating risk, I would suggest minimising the use of modals and to build even arcs of clear meaning and to avoid colourful language. Equally, in these extracts, it is difficult to determine whether we are talking about likelihood or desirability. In context, the proportions should be different, could signify that the client has argued that it's desirable or advisable that they be different under the circumstances, or it could signify that they are likely to be justified to be different on the basis of precedent. Shorter sentences would help clarify meaning. Again, in context, and which can entitle, could mean that it does permit them to such entitlement under the circumstances, or that it may be possible in some circumstances circumstances, but which may not be relevant to the matter at hand. You really have no idea whether it is relevant to your context or not, but it is found in another paragraph containing colourful literary language, such as at your peril. The exemplar, on the other hand, mainly uses deontic modality in politeness phrases. More detailed resources are due out shortly. However, I'd be interested in feedback on which parts of this presentation have been useful and what would be what would be more helpful. I can be found at a quick search online or emailed on tara.furlong at designingfutures.co.uk. Thank you.